Hi there. Good morning, afternoon, good evening. My name is Lynn Dolman. I'm Women in Cybersecurity Executive Director. We often go by our acronym WICYS, W-I-C-Y-S, and we pronounce it WICYS like we sisters because that's exactly what we are. We are a cyber sisterhood. And I'm so happy for everyone to join us here today on this Dell webinar where we have Ashwini presenting. I'm going to first share a little bit of information about the WICYS organization. We're a 501c3 member-based nonprofit with a mission to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. And we do so by creating opportunities. We have online member forum where we have special interest groups such as Latinas in Cybersecurity or David of Privacy or Cybersecurity Law. So wherever you want to have a conversation within cybersecurity and within the member portal, you could certainly have one with our existing special interest groups or you could launch your own. We have many different skill development training programs, and we have newsletters, webinars, scholarships, grants, and awards, not only for our conference that's coming up March 17th through the 19th in Cleveland, Ohio, but for other conferences as well. Our Cyber Talent Emergency Fund is available for students within their last four semesters of graduating from college. And we have many, many speaking and media opportunities because we want our members to be what others can see. And that's the cybersecurity professionals they are. Our Job Board Plus Plus is the place where strategic partners like Dell recruit from 24 seven. And all our members have access to update their profiles and upload their resumes there. In addition to that, we have leadership summits, leadership series. We have assistance programs for veterans, military spouses. We also have an apprenticeship program, an internship program. Our internship program is going to be launching tomorrow. So if you haven't done so already, please check out our website at wesis.org under all our initiatives and training programs and see what else is to come. So we owe all that as a special thanks to our strategic partners, AWS, Bloomberg, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, Cisco, Facebook, Dell, uh, Google, Intel, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft, Optum, Sentinel One, AbbVie, Fortinet, JP Morgan, Chase and Company, LinkedIn, Navy Federal Credit Union, Nike, Wayfair, Workday, Accenture, American Airlines, Arctic Wolf, Champlain College, City, Dell Technologies, which brings us here, the webinar today, DHS, InvestNet, Flatiron, Haystack Solutions, Here Technologies, The Home Depot, IBM, Indiana University, MITRE, Motorola Solutions, National Cyber League, Oak Ridge National Lab, Palo Alto Networks, PayPal, Salesforce, Science Institute, Schlumberger, SmoothStack, Speartip, Starbucks, Target, University of California, San Diego, and Ryzen. Woo, it is a mouthful, but we love and adore each and every one of our strategic partners and are so grateful for them to be able to support this nonprofit organization. So we're thrilled to have Ashwini here to be discussing ransomware. I mean, what a topic to definitely relevant and um, definitely great to have the industry expert that we have here today. And so this webinar is brought by Dell Technologies to you all, the WESIS community and more. And we encourage you to ask questions. This is your time to really, at the bottom of your screen, you just put your questions on there and Ashwini will be answering them at the end of the webinar. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the WESIS newsletter at WESIS.org. And we're all throughout social media on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook group. We have Facebook and Twitter and all that glory. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dell Technologies Ashwini, and she's going to take it from here. Thank you, Lynn. Hey, good morning, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So I'm Ashwini Siddhi. I'm from Dell Technologies, and I'm a senior principal product security advisor. I deal with the data protection suite of products, and I look into the security architecture, et cetera, and ensure that we build secure and resilient products. I'm also the threat modeling service owner for Dell Technologies. So we try to ensure that all products and applications across Dell Technologies do consistent threat modeling across every release. So if you would like to discuss threat modeling or secure design or anything related to threat modeling, a given process, cloud, privacy, anything under the sky, just reach out to me and we can talk about it. But today's topic is a lot different from threat modeling, right? Today we're talking about ransomware. So ransomware is like caught the fancy, right, of all of us in the security industry. Ever since the pandemic, we sort of have another pandemic 
pandemic and the virtual world. And anytime you log into a, a security related blog, a LinkedIn platform, a social media platform, you're, talk, you're seeing articles and everybody's talking about ransomware. There's so many attacks happening every second, every minute. And you know, it only makes sense that we talk about it. We understand what what's it like, what what the different hacker groups are like, what their motivations are, and eventually arrive at what's the best last line of defense for us uh, to fight this pandemic in the virtual world together. So that's what we're going to uh, talk about today. Uh, so behold, and without much ado, let's start off with ransomware and what it looks like for us. So before I, we actually delve deeper, right, I want to ask you, when was the first time you actually heard about a ransomware attack? Which was the ransomware attack that caught your attention? So was it like very recently, you know, or probably in early 2000? Whenever. So there's a poll out there. So I think we'll let it be for another minute. So I would really like to see your um, what you have to say about when, when was the first time you actually noticed a ransomware attack. I will give you a minute for this. So I see the answers coming in. It's good. It looks interesting. Okay, so we'll probably give it a couple of more seconds. All right, so, so a majority of you have heard it from the early 2000s. And a very close number heard it first in 2017. And a lot of you just heard it recently, 2021, 2020. Uh, when the colonial pipeline and the Kesea and the Accenture uh, attacks happened. Sounds fair. Uh, that's when we started hearing about all of these attacks. Um, amplified, right, over the media, etc. But ransomware attack has been around for a really long time. Certainly, early 2000s uh, were the time where we had wild variants. But the first ransomware, as it is known, was built in 1989 by a person called Joseph Pop. So this happened uh, during an AIDS conference. So what happened was that uh, Joseph Pop uh, was also involved very actively uh, around the education of AIDS, etc. So during this conference, there were email IDs uh, collected for people who attended the conference and they shipped out floppy disks to all of these participants. The content in this floppy disk was actually supposed to tell you whether you're su susceptible to AIDS or not, and also was supposed to give you artifacts related to content as to what you could do about it then. But along with this content, there was always also a malware embedded. But what happened, right, when people uh, started using this disk, nothing really happened. People went about using it like always and nothing really happened with it so there was like the 90th time when the end user rebooted the system this malware was unpacked was activated and it hid the files the directories and the c c directory and it also encrypted the name of the files so that's what it did as you can see it is very basic uh, it, it we had to wait for like the 90th time for it to unpack and execute. And also the fact that it did not really encrypt the content of the entire file. It just encrypted the name of the file. So that's what it did. And 
though very basic, it is still the first ransomware that was reported, and that was the beginning of all ransomware attacks. So this ransomware used uh, symmetric encryption. It was not even asymmetric, so it was easily reversible. And also the fact that it only asked about 189 USD dollars to be paid uh, to a PO box in Panama. So it means that it was easily traceable also. So thanks to all of these uh, drawbacks, the person who built this ransomware was arrested, who's called as Joseph Pop, also known as the father of ransomware. So after this, there were a lot of attempts with respect to ransomware, right, with symmetric encryption, et cetera, and all of that. But in 2005, the first ransomware with asymmetric encryption was known. It was called Archivus, and it was the first variant of the modern ransomware. So this is an important timeline in the history of ransomware because that's when people invested in asymmetric in, um, ransomwares that were built. And after which there were a lot of variants of the same ransomware of archivers. So a lot of them started using asymmetric encryption, uh, but most of them were unnamed variants. They didn't have a new name or anything of that sort. They were just experimenting with all of the new encryption that uh, they could be using. So from 20, 2005 to 2006, 2014, there were like a lot of ransomware variants in the wild, but an important point to be noted is that they were always evolving with respect to the strength of their uh, encryption uh, by using stronger encryption and stronger key sizes. And another thing that really impacted the ransomware business as such is the birth of Bitcoins. In 2008, 2009, the cryptocurrency, the Bitcoins came into picture. That means they didn't have to ask money to an unnamed PO box in Panama or any place in the world. It meant that you could have anonymity, sit anywhere in the world and ask for ransoms, ask for money, ask for your Bitcoins. So that gave them a huge leg up and that was an important um, timeline aspect in terms of ransomware. So after which, again, there were a lot of uh, better ransomware variants in terms of encryption. But by 2016 and 2017, we had already had WannaCry. I'm sure all of you know about WannaCry, right? So WannaCry was created such a huge uh, impact. There was so much chaos. It was all over uh, the world, uh, propagated as a worm throughout. So after which, there was a nation state sponsored attack. There was not Petya, which included the features of WannaCry and Petya ransomware and affected most of Ukraine. I'm sure all of you must have heard of this again, but I will just give a quick overview. Uh, there was a component, uh, probably a third party component that Musk, the shipping giant, downloaded from a family run business for some of their software components. And this third party component had an embedded malware which quickly propagated across the organization and they had to shut down all of their systems and had to ask employees to leave uh, by midday because it was so unmanageable. And by the end of the day, all of their transport, their ships, their cargoes, the trucks, everything had to come uh, to a halt because they didn't know where to download which uh, package to. So it was a huge financial loss. But it was not just MERS, the shipping uh, organization that was impacted. It was also most of Ukraine. In fact, a lot of government websites were down. And the media went about saying that there is no government anymore. There's nothing happening here. It's dark. And it, it was a very political scenario. And based on all the investigations, it was found that Russia had a hand behind this. So 2016 and 2017 is an important time in ransomware where we've had nation state actors being involved and also the birth of ransomware as a service before that much before that even when the encryption was evolving the focus was mostly on individual pcs and individual users and mostly window machines right windows so nobody really impacted big organization nobody really tried to breach organizations of the nature that uh, not better the nation state actor tried to breach. So back then, the impact was less and the 
organizations were not really worried about um, how this uh, threat actor was evolving. But with 2017, and I want to reiterate with the nation state actors and ransomware as a service, that's when it started becoming big and trying to get out of hand. And in 2018, around there had been works going on in the wings. And by 2019, December, we had Revil that had already stuck once with TravelX. I'm sure all of you would have heard of Revil. Revil, as the name says, is, is um, R Evil or Revil. Uh, it stands for Resident Evil or Ransomware Evil, right? So it was influenced by the movie Resident Evil, right? So it could mean ransomware evil or it could be resident evil as uh, proclaimed by one of the evil uh, hackers themselves uh, during an uncensored interview. So that was the beginning of Revil and Revil had such high profile attacks, they changed the scenario completely. And hence they're aptly called as the king of ransomware. I don't know if you would like to call them as king of ransomwares or not, uh, but yeah, that is what the security media has named them. So Revil, uh, after the TravelX attack has uh, not been quiet, I know, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of you have heard, they actually demanded 42 million from Donald Trump. They tried to breach uh, the encryption used by NSA to protect all of these files, especially related to tax evasion schemes, etc. And they claimed 42 million from the then US President Donald Trump. This was way back in May 2020. I'm not, they claimed that somebody offered to pay up but I'm not really sure it's confidential data. So I don't know if they received the amount or not. After which they tried to seize uh, data related to Lady Gaga and then Madonna and then came 2021, right? So they moved from individuals to uh, IT service companies. They tried uh, hacking into uh, electronics corporation Acer. They tried uh, stealing uh, product schematics from Apple. So Apple had some new designs which they wanted to go live with in April 2021 and uh, Revil uh, stole the plans for these upcoming products too. But in May is when they had one of their really high profile attacks that is with the JBS uh, US beef plants and they actually demanded 11 million ransom in Bitcoin. Uh, they, JBS did pay the amount and that's when you know it was all over the news, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they, these have been their low profile attacks, but their most predominant or most high profile attack has been the Keseya attack. I'm sure all of you would have heard of this again. So, but I'm just uh, trying to cover the history of the attack, right? With the Keseya attack, um, you know, uh, it was about uh, 70 million dollars were actually demanded as a ransom uh, to ensure that the data was restored. And not just about the ransom that was demanded, it impacted about 800 stores globally, about 60 MSPs and 1,500 businesses. Anything from a, a Swedish grocery store chain to or uh, kindergarten in New Zealand were all of them impacted. So this actually, uh, made Biden call up uh, the Russian president Putin and told him very clearly that, you know, uh, he expects uh, Russia to do something about uh, all of these attacks arising out of his soil. If not, uh, uh, he would actually send out an army to uh, Russia, a physical army to Russia, so things would get worse. So ransomware had the potential from going from a small AIDS Trojan demanding about 189 USD to creating a war. So that's how it has evolved and that's how it has grown. Yes, in about September, October, there were uh, FBI, Interpol, Europol, all of them behind the Revil gang and so many of their affiliates have been arrested. But have all of them been arrested? We surely don't know yet, right? They also have um, one of their close associate hacker group, the Dark Side. Uh, Darkseid 2 have had plenty of attacks before, but their most predominant one had been the Colonial Pipe 
hack where they demanded about again you know so many bitcoins and they attacked the billing systems because of which colonial pipe shut down their operations and uh, people were stranded and had no gas no oil to travel all of that so with the colonial pipe hack biden actually put a 10 million bounty uh, on the dark side and reveal um, affiliates so anybody who actually gave them information or uh, actually uh, any sort of information or help them uh, capture these uh, gang members they would receive a certain uh, amount of money so this was like an important aspect in terms of ransomware because the governments came into picture and it could also highlight the fact that ransomwares could impact critical infrastructure and bring a country to halt right it they have attacked hospitals they have attacked um, oil oil plants all of it so they could critical infrastructure can be impacted by all of these hacker groups they claim to be apolitical they claim to uh, be charitable in fact dark side claims in fact they also put up a receipt of having donated to uh, water projects to children projects across the world uh, though these projects didn't accept the donation but still the hacker groups claim that they've donated and they've publicly claimed that they do not want to inconvenience any civilians it's just that the outcome of this uh, colonial pipe hack was that uh, it was invariantly that they got impacted but they are intention was not to shut down the systems they just wanted to demand a ransom so that's what they claim but despite all their claims we've seen that has impacted all regular civilians and all of us and that's why it's so important uh, to ensure that you know we do something about ransomware attacks So any questions about Reveal, Dark Side, I think I will take it at the end. Um, I don't really want to stop. You know, I, I, I'm looking at it as a story, right, with AIDS Trojan coming to picture, impacting individuals, and then we've had something like a Reveal impacting critical infrastructure and probably uh, being a reason for war too. So let's continue with the story and see how, how far we get, get with it. So with Reveal and Dark Side affiliates being arrested uh, with the entire uh, uh, world uh, police being behind them, right? It, it probably should have meant the end of ransomware, but certainly not the end. Uh, though in Q4 of 2021, the number of ransomware attacks fell down to 63% only. So it fell down by 63%. That means that a lot of these affiliates, a lot of these hacker groups went underground. But still, it did not mean the end of ransomware. We had in August Lockpit to evolve and attack Accenture. Though Accenture claims that not a lot of its data was lost because they had cutting edge detection methodologies. That's what they claim to do, have. So, but still, it was a high profile attack, right? It was an IT services major company and they had so many terabytes of data that they had managed to uh, encrypt and take a backup of. So that is with Accenture. And outside of Lockpit, we've also had groups like Conti. If you've heard of Conti, Conti is something that uh, uh, initially attacked the Ireland hospital systems, right? So uh, they attacked the hospital systems, but they had some sort of conscience later and they actually gave out the decryptor keys for free. Uh, and uh, they tried to decrypt the systems, but it took about 73 days. That's a different thing. So Conti has been making some amount of noise after Lockpit. So when Reveal and Darkside went down, Lockpit and uh, Conti has been running parallelly and creating a buzz and trying to create high profile attacks. Uh, also, we've had Black Matter ransomware emerge. Uh, these are supposedly successors to Darkside and Reveal. So the affiliates that didn't get arrested or managed to stay away from trouble uh, started off as a new group as Black Matter. And um, uh, they've been trying to uh, attack systems, uh, businesses, etc. But these have been mostly low profile for now. We do not know how it's going to look like uh, in the future. So before we get into the next stage of what happens with all of these ransomware newsmakers and all of that, I would like to know about what is your uh, uh, favorite uh, ransomware attack, right? When I say 
favorite uh, i want to know um which of these attacks really caught your fancy which one is like oh my god wow you know is this really the case did it happen so i want to you know hear about hear from you which one was the ones that really caught your attention so i think we put up a poll out here and then you can let me know Yeah, so the polls open, the hack that most. Okay, so 100% colonial pipeline. Yes, I think that's that makes sense because the JBS and the colonial pipeline happened right uh, in May. And that's when Biden came into the picture. And that's when we knew the critical infrastructure was impacted. So yes, it makes sense. And Accenture too, yes, so 15% for Accenture. Yes, it was Lockbit, emergence of a new variant of Lockbit. Lockbit was always existed before Reaver and Darkseid, but the fact that they revamped themselves and came back as a new variant and could actually get into systems of an IT service major meant a lot. Great. Yeah, and I see some people that have voted for NotPetya. Um, yeah, NotPetya was uh, nation state sponsored, was intended to bring down businesses in Ukraine. Uh, but not Petya actually did not demand a ransom. It, it it looked like it was demanding a ransom. There was a note out there, but it you know when you actually tried to pay, it wouldn't do anything. So the whole idea behind not Petya was, in fact, the name itself says right. It's not Petya. Petya was a ransomware, but not Petya means that it is not a ransomware. So even if you wanted to pay ransom and get your uh, systems up and running, it wouldn't happen because there's really no way to be doing that. In fact, then you would be surprised. Okay, I have a question. Then if it was not a ransomware, how did they get their systems back? Okay, that's a great question, right? So what happened was obviously any organization, right? They have backups everywhere. It so happened that there was a power outage in one of the countries where they had backup and it was in Ghana. So when this ransomware or pretend ransomware propagated into the system, it so happened that uh, it could not get into the Ghana backup because there was a power outage, right? So it was disconnected from the network. So they were extremely lucky in that case that uh, the power outage happened and the system was disconnected. But they had a hell of a time because there's no way that they could send all of that data in terabytes from Ghana to um, Ukraine over the net. That was not going to happen. Their disaster recovery center was in Britain. Again, that was not going to happen, which meant somebody had to physically carry these backups and come uh, to Britain. But there was nobody in Ghana who had a visa for uh, UK. It meant waiting for a month's time. So they had to travel to Nigeria where there was somebody who had a visa to UK. And so Ghana to Nigeria handed over to somebody in Nigeria this person took uh, the backup over the flight and then uh, gave it to the person in UK and then the backups were restored. It, it must have been a crazy flight, right? I mean, it must have been so stressful. Imagine if somebody stole it from there at that point, or, you know, crazy, crazy stress. But yeah, that is the interesting story between how they brought it up. Yeah, so that's a good question. Great question. Thank you for it. All right, so that is with um, the major attacks, the major ransomware newsmakers and all that. So with the newsmakers, all I can say is that, right, it's it's even if the ransomware attacks the last quarter was down by 63%, we saw N number of variants coming into the picture. They were lying low, yes, but we saw so many of them coming into the picture. Like I said, we had Lockbit emerging in version 2.0, we had Conti, we had Hive, we have White Rabbit, we have Night Sky. And in fact, while we talk, there are attacks on Germany um, oil uh, companies that are going on. In fact, the Northern Germany has issues with ransomware attack right now. Uh, the Black Cat ransomware has attacked them and they are having issues right while we talk. And there is a snacking company called KP Snacks that's been hacked just very recently. And also in Belarus, uh, the activist group hacked the country's railway system just recently, right, a week ago, to uh, protest against the president and to protest against the movement of Russian troops in their country. So it is 
not necessarily limited to high profile attacks and business the reason could be anything the motivation could be anything and it, it could be spread across the world and it could impact any businesses any country it could have political annotations it means that it is an ever evolving threat landscape right there is no stopping ransomware until we come up with a right solution to it in fact the fbi has claimed that overall in the year we've had 400% increase in ransomware and revil alone had made more than 100 million the last year so that's uh, and they're not happy with it they want to make billions and if they are in a good mood they want to make more than billions that is what was claimed by them in an in uncensored interview again and every 6 seconds there is a cyber breach not necessarily ransomware but there is a cyber breach so using which we can use to propagate a ransomware right so that means the attack surface is so much more and so far it has been only that the data has been encrypted and you're demanding a ransomware but what happens if you have a backup do you still want to pay for the data yes you know they might threaten to release sensitive data which is out on the public uh, facing systems on let's say we will happy block they put out all your sensitive data would you want that no so they pressurize you more it's called double extortion will they stop at double extortion do you think so obviously not right maybe they will invent another mechanism you know to pressurize you more maybe they will come up with triple extortion triple extortion would mean that okay um, your data is encrypted uh, your con- uh, confidential data is out there for everybody to see they completely wipe out all your data they shut your systems down cause a denial of service or maybe if you're a vendor uh, who's uh, giving out systems to different uh, companies maybe they implant a malware which affects all of your customers too so the extortion uh, nth factor could be anything so this is constantly evolving and it's really a uh, high time that we did something about this attack so what is that we can do about this so right there are a lot of things we can do about it but i think before we do that it's important to understand uh, how an anatomy of a typical ransomware attack looks like right only then we will be able to uh, introduce controls at strategic points uh, to be able to Uh, stop these attacks so if you're good so let's start off with the technical aspect of the stock so let's look at how the anatomy of a typical ransomware attack looks like most of these attacks start with phishing more than 70% of these attacks start with phishing but it's not necessarily limited to phishing it could also mean that somebody is browsing through your externally exposed networks uh, to brute force into the systems or maybe rdp into the systems or also there may be zero day vulnerabilities like with the kesaya attack right it was an authentication bypass vulnerability so somebody managed to get into this authenticated session and they were able to run commands uh via sql injection eventually they could do a remote code execution and that's how they managed to impact 60 msps and 1500 businesses so the attack surface could be anything could be brute force could be rdp could be zero day vulnerabilities it just depends on the technicality of the ransomware that is built but the good thing about ransomware right it's not something that okay there's a question out here one second let me take a look out here all right so the question is like okay uh, is the person who's developing the ransomware or deploying it it could be right uh, the reveal hacker told that they do this and they do that and they do a lot of things they fly here and there that was the exact words used by them which means that ransomware as a service right i could write the code for ransomware because i'm technically good maybe just saying hypothetical all right but you have no malware skills no problem i put it up on the dark web you download it for a monthly subscription you download it for a monthly subscription and try to penetrate a network maybe you're good at doing that so you procure the ransomware from these ransomware makers and uh, penetrate a network and then install this ransomware that's one thing but maybe you can't do both not a problem you still have distributors you still have affiliates that can get into the network for you you can also have initial access brokers 
or the network access brokers. They manage to get access to you into different networks. They've already stolen credentials, et cetera, and they sell it to you for some amount of money. So I'm not sure if you've heard of this guy called Vaza Vaka. He's quite famous. Uh, he's on... Uh, he used to be on Twitter, now he's uh, underground, uh, but uh, he's quite famous across uh, uh, the hacking community. Apparently, he was the one who helped Darkseid, Lockbit, and Reveal uh, procure all of the initial accesses. Accenture's attack was known to be an insider attack. At least uh, they managed to get into the credentials of an insider uh, or or buy from that insider. So it was known to be an insider attack. So Vaza Vaka was supposed to have helped them with this. So he is nothing but a network access broker. So people have a price, right? There's always an intermediary. So these hacker groups pay them for these accesses. So it's not necessary that somebody is just sending out a crazy payload with you know amazing technical capabilities. Sometimes they just pay money for these network access and buy it and then install the ransomware. So what happens once that is installed, right? So there's an important aspect to it. So it actually checks for the system language, the location. So these ransomwares typically do not uh, attack the common wealth of independent states. When I say commonwealth of independent state, it means that it checks for these languages, Russian, Armenian, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Moldova, uh, all the countries around that place, right? Kazakhstan, so it checks, and sometimes even Syria. So it has a check around this, and if it belongs to any of these countries, the malware does not unpack, the malware does not execute at all. Only if it is outside of these um, countries, this malware unpacks yeah, itself. And what happens after it's unpacked depends a lot on different malware variants. So typically, right, some of the malwares are signed, code signing, right? They're signed by a certificate, by an uh, authentic CA they are signed. So all of these malware protection, ransomware protection, and antivirus systems look at the software and say, okay, it's already signed, so it must be coming from some trusted source. So these work on the assumption that anything that is signed is trusted which is not necessarily the case, right? It does not tell me whether it should be running in the first place or not. They just look at, okay, it is signed and then assume it's good and let it run. So once that happens, uh, they start look, try to look at the endpoints first. That is the network endpoints. They try to disable it. Uh, not all uh, ransomwares can do it yet, but some of them try to do it because that's when the alerts and all of that start going. So they try to uh, disable all of these things first, including the Windows Defender, if it is a Windows PC, etc. They start deleting these log files specifically related to security events. So that's, that's how they get into the system and stealthily start doing things. And once they start doing this, they could do a lot of things. Ransomware can be of different types. It could be a locker, it could be a crypto, and it could be a wiper. So what does a locker do? It sim simply locks you out of the system and you know uh, displays this, changes your wallpaper and displays this saying that, okay, you have a ransomware attack and you need to pay up and you can't get into the complete system. It uh, uh, encrypts the entire master boot record. What about crypto? It's encryption, but maybe not all files are encrypted. Some important files where there are sensitive data could be encrypted. And Viper, it completely deletes all of the data. Right? You have nothing on your systems, nothing on your uh, servers, nothing. All of it is deleted. So local crypto and Viper. Uh, so the malware functions uh, accordingly based on what variant it is. Right. So before all of this is done, there is a backup that is taken of all of your data. Right. So all of this data is taken as a backup. Uh, so let's say it is a crypto malware. So it is trying to encrypt all your files on your system. But before doing that, it is taking multiple copies of backups. And it's also running on multi-thread. There are multiple encryptions happening at one go so that uh, the action is fast, the encryption is fast, and none of your systems detect it. 
So what happens after this? So they leave behind a message uh, saying that you're hacked and there is a public key associated with it, right? So, and you will have the details of who to contact or how to contact for negotiation. So again, it is a ransomware as a service. You get to negotiate. That's the, I wouldn't want to call the beauty of it, but yeah, that's, that's the trait of it. So you get to use the key, connect with the contact or the support team of this ransomware folks, and you get to negotiate. Yes, obviously you would need to negotiate because maybe uh, they've uh, requested from you about $70 million. But then when you negotiate, you can get it down to $20 million. It has actually happened. There are ransomware groups that have reduced 80% of the ransom that they have been demanded. So negotiation, uh, a lot of companies would like to do. So they have a public key so that they can get to the negotiation site, connect with the support people, and maybe also have a translator. So maybe this uh, attacker group is in Russia and uh, you are somebody in France and you want to communicate very well. So you need a common language, you need a translator. So maybe a translator comes into the picture and then you negotiate for it. And once you negotiate, you make the payment, let's say, and then the private key is delivered to you and then you can go and unpack uh, this uh, no, sorry, not unpack. You can decrypt all of the content of the files and get your data back. So that's how the typical anatomy of a ransomware attack looks like. And that is how they would expect you to function, gather the private key and decrypt it. So that is a typical um, anatomy of a ransomware attack. So let me see if there are any questions. Okay, so what is the language of... Um, in what language do these malware come in? So Reveal uses um, C, C++, okay? Uh, Darkseid also uses C, C++. So that is it. But there are uh, ransomwares known to be using uh, uh, HTML. There, uh, there are ransomwares uh, known to be using uh, Rust. So there are ransomwares using variety of content, right? Uh, but uh, the ones that have created a lot of noise, uh, that is Reveal and Darkseid, are using C as the language to develop their malware. All right, so I see another question. Okay, what is the encryption that you're using? Again, the encryption could vary uh, based on the ransom uh, web that we're talking about, right? So uh, Reveal uses Salsa 20. They have three keys, all right? So they have a file key, they have a system key, and they have an affiliate key. So the file key is, uh, a, a, it is using Salsa 2020 and uh, another randomly generated key, which is hard coded with another RSA key and then built together and encrypted it. So uh, they use Salsa 20 and um, three different keys to it. So that's how Reveal works. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So yeah, so now that we know what ransomware uh, looks like and how it works, uh, we, we are better equipped to understand what we should be doing to prevent it. So yes, there's a NIST cybersecurity framework that could be applied to this case. But how well we apply it, that's, that's a concern, right? So typically, we should be planning for the ransomware attack. Most organizations to, did, to this day do not really plan for it. They don't really have... Uh, a plan and a playbook on how to respond to it. They don't have updated network diagrams to it. So all of this need to be in place. And the thing about planning is to know that, yes, I could be attacked. It is not being um, proud or arrogant about, oh, I'm not hackable because I've invested so much budget in here, et cetera, et cetera. Not a thing, right? You should think that despite my best efforts, there could be a ransomware attack and have a plan, have a response plan, have your systems updated with network architecture, you know what you need to be doing, et cetera. And the next stage comes to identifying. So what would you identify here? Most people think when they are identifying, it means identify your assets with respect to your systems. Okay, this is an important server. It is keeping everything up and running uh, across the organization, great. But that's not it, right? You need to be identifying things like your uh, LDAP servers, how were they configured? What about your AD? 
What about your certificates? Do you have a backup of them? Do you have your firewall configurations, your router configurations? Do you have your hardware configurations? Any algorithms that you're using? What about their configurations? Any code that you've built? What about them? The golden images, the developer libraries, documentations related to checklist, even contact list, even your playbook related to ransomware. Are you identifying all of these things? And are you trying to protect not just your systems, but all of these things also come into the picture? And when you identify, it is not only about identifying what you need. It is also about identifying what you don't need. A lot of times we miss out on that aspect. So maybe you don't need to be enabling PowerShell across all of your users, but you have it enabled. Why do you need it? So identify such software, have a wide, uh, identify such software and ensure that they're deleted and you know not available to all your systems. And maybe they have a process to go through if they really need it. So that is with identification. So moving on to protect. Okay, when we say protect, we all know, yes, you know, it's this huge array of things that we would like to do, have multi-factor authentication, limit communication, apply least privileges, uh, network segmentation, zero trust architecture, defense in depth, um, separation of duties, patch regularly, endpoint hardening, supply chain management. So there's so much you could do. There's so many different things you could do. Uh, so all of this need to be followed up and done thoroughly with Protect. I think all of us are very well versed with Protect. There's nothing really new that comes into the picture here. Uh, it's just about patching regularly, right? When WannaCry happened, all of the systems had um, all of the systems had SMB1 enabled. That's what caused the attack. And the fact that they did not uh, stop these exploits, right? So that was the thing. So you need to be able to have a mechanism to prevent these exploits from coming in. So it means that your detection uh, methodologies has to be so much more better. So when we talk about detect, most companies talk about, yes, I have a firewall. Yes, I have an IDS and IPS and I'm good, et cetera. But that's not it, right? You need to identify better in indicators of compromise for ransomware specifically. So when I say better indicators of compromise, it means encryption. Is there any encryption that is happening randomly in the system? If so, how do I prevent it? How do I detect it? Maybe have a specific identification just for encryption, like a crypto guard. So it identifies any unintended encryption that is happening across your network system, and then it rolls it back. So have software specific to ransomware indicators of compromise don't depend on your regular IDS and IPS. And then comes your respond, right? Respond is typical. We all know when a disaster recovery happens, we just stop and uh, connect it off the internet, uh, limit it, um, contain it, and ensure that maybe sometimes you re-image it and then bring it up, sanitize it, run another scan, and then connect to your rest of your systems and then update a playbook to uh, reflect lessons learned. So respond is straightforward too. But what happens if a ransomware breaches all of these protections? You know, they breach your protect, they breach your detect, and they you actually end up having a ransomware. So that, that is a crazy scenario, right? You, you wouldn't want to throw up your hands in the air and suddenly start running around to pay ransom. The treasury is also informed us not to be paying ransom. Even in colonial hack and uh, the company actually paid a ransom, they got the decryptor, but still it took them a lot of time to bring up the system because the decryption key was so slow, right? The average time to bring up a system from a ransomware attack is 73 days, even if you have the decryptor key. So that is assuming the attacker is around and gives you the key. What happens if they go down underground like Reveal? Suddenly they're not there to give you the decryptor key. What would you do, right? So you need to have a way to recover from ransomware and paying ransom is not the way for it. So what is the methodology for it? So there is something called as a cyber recovery solution for specifically for ransomware, which is very different from uh, disaster recovery, right? Disaster recovery is not cyber recovery. So Dell had built the solution for cyber recovery way back in 2015, even before the WannaCry happened. 
in 2015, we developed something called an isolated recovery solution. It meant that unlike disaster recovery, which is constantly connected to your network to take backup, this one is isolated and only connects as and when required. And then in 2018, we rebranded it as cyber recovery solution to recover from ransomware. And in 2019, there came an initiative from the uh, organization in US, specifically finance organization, to ensure that people had some sort of confidence in all of these financial uh, organizations. So they came out with a set of guidelines about how all of these banks and how all of these financial organizations had to use a cyber recovery solution. So Dell's cyber recovery solution was the first product to be part of this initiative uh, from 2015 to 2020, even now. And we've had about 300 plus customers for the same cyber recovery solution. So what is a cyber recovery solution? So like I said, it is not a typical disaster recovery solution. The principles of a cyber recovery solution is that isolated. It is always isolated physically as well as logically separated. It is no way connected to your production or your backup or even your disaster recovery systems. And what about immutability? Maybe I'm an admin of this backup system. What if Reveal comes to me and offers me some money? I might be willing to give them access to this backup, right? So there has to be protection against insider attacks. There has to be immutability. So what is immutability? Immutability is not being able to change the data even if I have access to it. So immutability is a big principle of cyber recovery. And when we talk about immutability, it is not just related to software, it is also prevalent to hardware as well as firmware. Me as an admin who has access to the system, I should not be able to change data at any level, at any tier. That is immutability. And it should only be write once and read many times. So that is a major principle of cyber recovery solution for ransomware. And intelligence, right? So if a ransomware has propagated from the production back into your cyber recovery itself what would you do you need some amount of intelligence for that so that is when the ml and ai come into the picture here so all of these three principles together form a solution for ransomware recovery independently each thing is not going to do anything for you they are worse than a disaster recovery solution but together they are the best bet for your last line of defense that is your last way of recovering from a ransomware attack. So this is how a typical implementation of a CR solution would look like, right? You have the production, you have a backup, uh, and you have the cyber recovery vault for ransomware protection. As you can see, there is an air gap out here. What is an air gap? Air gap is where you don't have network interfaces to be connected to another network. So you install diodes here electronic diodes, right, which are unidirectional. So you have vendors that do it for you. So once you install diodes, they can open and close as and when required only based on a specific policy. So let's say there is a ransomware attack. What happens? How do we recover? OK, so assuming that you're in production and you would have taken backup, which is already present in the cyber recovery world because it has a backup server out there and then you have sanitized your systems, you've re-imaged them, you've run scans, there's no malware anywhere at the data center now. So now you would want to back up. So how is it going to back up? So this air gap is going to be automated, opened by your specific policy, and all the data that is residing in the cyber recovery vault would go over a single channel. Okay, as you can see, the data coming in is over a different channel and the data going back is over a different channel. And both of them are operational uh, based on diodes only and based on a policy. For most of the time, it is closed. They are two disseparate systems. Only when the policy runs, it gets connected to the backup and the copy of which is in the cyber recovery world goes back to your uh, backup in the data center. But let's say, how do I know that the copy in cyber recovery itself is right? So every few hours or you have a timeline set, right? This air gap opens, the data comes from the backup to the cyber recovery server backup content and tries to sit there. So do, does the server simply collect the data and uh, 
store it no right it does a full content analysis of this data it just not just look at the metadata but it's going to look at the full content it is going to analyze if there is any change from the current version to the previous version and it has about 100 different uh, indicators of compromise based on which only it is going to store the new copy if something fails it is going to discard and roll back to the previous version and it is also going to store all of the latest signatures of all hashes for ransomware. So it is always going to compare those hashes with existing ones to see if it is present in the backup or not, and only then store it. So it means that any data that is stored here, the full content is always free of malware. And when this air gap is opened, the free malware content is going to go back and sit in your backup and that's how you're going to recover from your malware so that is what a typical malware solution uh, ransomware recovery solution looks like and the best features for this would be that obviously you need to enforce complete mediation you need to have multi-factor authentication like i said i could be an admin at the cyber recovery vault and i could breach the system so you need to have multi-factor authentication you need to have a different security officer who has specific roles a regular admin shouldn't be having everything so these are the features that you would need to consider and your backup should support multi-backup software right it's not that you support just one then you need to have 100 different cyber recovery vaults to take backup your cyber recovery vault should be supporting all of these uh, backup like a data domain or anything that uh, is a backup system and anything that is written into the system has to be worm immutable it has to be read uh, many times but write once only and it has to align to all the financial regulations and the security exchange act of the us uh, to be aligned and to be certified to say that you are providing protection against ransomware right and also you should have all the ai and ml analytics if there's a new ransomware you should be immediately able to get in the hashes and compare it with against it so these are the best features for a cyber recovery solution uh, that will help you recover from a typical ransomware attack so uh, i rushed in the last five minutes so that i give you enough time for questions because i see a lot of questions out here uh, so I'm going to take the questions. So this was with what what is the best line of defense for ransomware. So let me take the uh, questions. OK, are the cryptocurrency exchanges involved in some way abetting this ransomware? Could be, right? We don't know who the stakeholders are. It could be because it is giving them so much limelight. So that is why FBI and the US actually sanctioned some of these cryptocurrencies um, and banned them to uh, that is one of the things. Yeah. It is said to not negotiate with terrorists. Does it also apply here? OK, yes. Uh, the Treasury and Homeland Department in the US, all of them have clearly said do not negotiate for ransomware. Instead, just have a cyber recovery solution. And there is a, already a website that is there specifically for ransomware, Stop Ransomware, which is uh, uh, created by the government of us so you just report it to them you just go up to them and report this incident and they will handle it for you do not try to negotiate with the attacker because even if they gave you something what makes you think they're going to give you something sane back maybe the data that they're giving you to de-encrypt could contain a malware again so you don't know what is happening in fact, Reveal did that, right? They had third party affiliates who were negotiating on their behalf, but Reveal put in a back door. So after a negotiation point was reached, Reveal cut off these third party people by uh, imposing as the customer and saying that, no, OK, uh, we will not be paying, but came back to the customer uh, imposing as the negotiator saying, OK, we are OK with this x amount of money that you're giving and did a third party like man in the middle and took away the money so there is really no point trusting these uh, ransomware hacker groups their motive is just to make money and cause trouble so it does apply here do not negotiate with ransomware uh, attackers they are virtual terrorists yeah what do you what do you think which ransomware attack was the eye opener for security community 
Okay, so I would say uh, for anybody who's uh, technically uh, inclined to building solutions, etc., the wanna cry was an eye opener. That's when uh, a lot of companies started coming with. Um, um, I wouldn't say cyber recovery, I would say disaster recovery to use for this, but it doesn't work. So cyber recovery 2015 uh, Dell came out with. So I would say for a lot of them who are technologically uh, focused, 2015 was the eye opener. But outside of that, for if you're like a, a regular person into security news, I think the colonial pipe was a great attack uh, to be an eye opener because that's when um, Biden and all of them came into the picture and the 10 million bounty. And if you look at the security news, right, you have so many people running behind all of these hackers. In fact, we have journalists covering the wedding of these hackers. There are so many glamorous pictures out there. So it is constantly in the news since colonial pipe. So I think uh, the widespread awareness of ransomware happened with Colonial. How much patch management and platform hardening processes contribute to the attack? Okay, so how much uh, patch manage patch management? Um, Yes, because people don't regularly patch, right? WannaCry happened because there was no SM, uh, uh, because SMB V1 was being used. And if you went and looked at systems uh, in some of the organizations, they might still be using it. In fact, they might not even have uh, identification in the place for NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. They don't even know which systems run in their organization. So yes, patch management is a really big thing. And that's why it's really important to have it in place. First, identify your systems and then start patching them. In fact, the log4j issue was also tried to be breached by ransomware groups like Conti and all of that. So it's really important. You patch your systems as quickly as possible. Okay, case study of someone affected by ransomware. So there was a specific bank. I mean, a lot of this data is supposed to be confidential, right? One in three companies don't report the ransomware attack that happened to them in the public, right? Though they're supposed to, they don't. So uh, there was a bank uh, that we helped achieve this uh, isolated recovery uh, using this cyber recovery solution. So it is a generic example. I, I, I will not be able to take names. <laughs> Uh, cyber resiliency, there is no training as such, but you can reach out to me. I will certainly be willing to share uh, any uh, documents, any white papers, all of it related to it. I can do that. Okay, another question, are they really nation state sponsored? I believe so, because again, recently we heard about 70% of Ukraine's um, um, government's websites being down and Russia was named for it. Um, so I believe so. And it is the intelligence that is coming from a lot of intel organizations. It is not media making it up. It's not me telling you. So uh, I, if they were to be believed, yes, it is nation state sponsored. And I believe it's uh, less, it's better than a physical army going out for a war. Uh, it has multiple implications on critical infrastructure. So I think it is a smarter way of doing things. And so I do believe a smarter country would be using this as a nation state sponsored attack. Uh, favorite countries to target. Uh, US obviously, like you know, is the most um, targeted uh, uh, country. Uh, next comes uh, um, France and then Belgium and then Canada. So that is the favorite. Has India ever been targeted? Uh, nothing high profile really, uh, but there has been attacks on Telangana's power grid. So recently, it, it didn't make a lot of noise, but uh, yes, they've been attacked, but they managed to recover it uh, very well too from it. Um, are there any ransomwares that don't check for location? Yes, there are ransomwares that don't check for uh, location. It's called Dear World Ransomware. Um, I, uh, no high profile attacks yet, so I don't know much about them. But yes, there are some groups that don't check for locations. Um, what is the best ransomware? <laughs> OK, that's really an interesting question. Uh, what is the best ransomware? So I think the current black cat ransomware should be the best ransomware uh, because it is using Rust, the latest. Uh, and using Rust, uh, you're also following secure coding guidelines because it has so many more security features. So it's uh, less easy to detect it for people who hunt for ransomware. And also, they come with a lot of configurations. When I say configuration, I can choose the encryption that I want. I can choose the key size I want. So it comes with a lot of user 
benefits and I can choose what I want. And so I think it has evolved from Reveal and Darkseid and they've technologically advanced. So I think Black Cat ransomware is the latest and the one that we should be looking out for. All right, so uh, which is the best ransomware group? Uh, there's nothing like that because uh, it's like all of them, I think, are hand in glove. Today, they are with dark side. Some people get arrested, so they go to Reveal and then they become black matter. So it's, you know, constantly moving from one group to the other. Uh, but I think my personal, I, I wouldn't call favorite, but the one that I've invested most in and researched is Reveal uh, because... Um, yeah, I mean, they, uh, apparently they're very glamorous and they're very uh, technologically smart. They're also connected to the um, uh, FSS of Russia, which is the FBI equivalent of US. And uh, yeah, so it, they have a lot to them, a lot more dynamics. Um, and uh, they are also known to be state sponsored, unlike uh, other Russian hacker groups, uh, the most favorite of the uh, uh, of the country uh, so yeah so that is the one that has really caught my fancy so that's why you probably heard me mention about reveal a lot of times so yeah so these were the questions i don't have any more questions so i guess that's about it so do reach out to me if you still have questions i'm available on linkedin and we can always connect and uh, um, talk about it all right I, I still see some questions, but I don't think we can really extend it. But yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me and I hope to connect with you offline. Thank you so much, all of you.